First time for everything. Very good. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education in Baltimore County for August 7th, 2018. Uh, as you can see, I am not Mr. Gillis. I have a few less gray hairs, but I'm sure tonight will help me out in that regard. Uh, Mr. Gillis sends his regards. So uh, earlier this evening, the board convened a closed session in accordance with the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons to discuss the appointment and uh, appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of our closed session may be found on our website at www.bcps.org backslash board backslash minutes. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Chase and Ken Friedley from Lansdowne Elementary School of the Southwest area. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Ms. White? There are no changes or additions. All right, hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Do we need to vote on the agenda? It stands, right? Yeah. So sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who signed will be permitted to speak. So with that, I will ask. Our first speaker is David Green. Second is Megan Berger. Third is Dr. Bosch Ferron. That is it, folks. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policies, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute and resolution processes as appropriate. I would remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or say the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I now call our advisory groups to speak, and our first advisory group member is Abby Baton. Good evening, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. We are beginning a new school year, and as always, we work over the summer to address some of the issues that have been in evidence from previous school years. Discipline has been one of the most persistent problems on which we must place much, much of our focus. The number one concern I hear from teachers across the board at all levels is discipline. The issue is pervasive not only in our schools, but in our neighborhoods and throughout society. 
we must not only look for solutions to inappropriate behaviors in our classrooms, but on the underlying causes of these behaviors. Finger pointing and blaming one group or another for these problems does nothing but cause us against them mentalities. There is no magic bullet to fix these issues. Passing a policy of no tolerance, one size fits all procedures undermines the opportunities that a more comprehensive board, broad reaching policy could address. The problems are so pervasive that without a multi-pronged approach and the necessary resources to go with them, there will be no solutions. Until we address the needs of all our students and understand their lives inside and outside of the schoolhouse, we are putting no more than a Band-Aid on the issues facing our society. Restorative practices hold great promise, but if implemented too quickly without the necessary training for staff, students, and parents, it will fall flat and in the process be labeled a failure. All the in interventions and great ideas need time and human resources to truly address the issues. To that end, we are pleased that many of the TABCO Discipline Committee ideas have been part of the discussion with BCPS and that Ms. White has formed the BCPS Behavior and Discipline Council, which includes some of the members from the TABCO Discipline Committee. And thank you for that. We know this work is hard and at times frustrating, but the work needs to be done and all need to be involved and willing to take the time necessary to make the changes for our schools to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker from the PTA Council of Baltimore County is Leslie Weber. Good evening, Vice Chairman Stewart, Board of Education members, and Ms. White. I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair for the PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Jane Lee. We were happy to learn last week that the new Baltimore County Cares for Kids program will offer free breakfast and lunch to 7,000 students now qualifying for free and reduced, redu reduced price meals. This is definitely a step in the right direction. The hitch with the new program is the fact that the meal eligibility form is still required. We know as longtime advocates with a presence in schools all over the county that many children slip through the cracks. Either their families don't qualify for farms, even though they're barely making ends meet, or perhaps they're afraid to or unable to fill out farms paperwork. This is especially true in high poverty schools. Right before the new program was announced, we reached out to PTA presidents at the 51 schools eligible to implement the Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP, urging them to advocate for the program. While it's fantastic that thousands of students will receive free meals through the new program, thousands more would benefit from CEP, a federally funded program offering free breakfast and lunch to all students at eligible schools. If CEP were implemented at the 19 schools immediately avail eligible, the cost would only be one million per year. For the 51 schools, the cost would be about three million per year. Both are actually small percentages of the BCPS's $1.8 billion operating budget. We know that BCPS cares deeply for the students in its care. We know that teachers, administrators, nurses, guidance counselors, social workers, office and cafeteria staff and classmates often feed hungry children. We applaud after, meal, after school meal programs, summer feeding programs and backpack programs like Food for Thought in place in some schools. However, we know through our partnership with the Student Support Network and our own efforts to promote the creation of food pantries in schools that children have been missed. This patchwork of efforts proves that a comprehensive, multi-pronged, system-wide approach to addressing food insecurity is needed. CEP would help reach many of the hungry children who are lost in the shuffle. Please take a closer look at adding on to the Baltimore County Cares for Kids program by expanding CEP based on information shared with BCPS the board by Marilyn Hunger Solutions and the Student Support Network. The deadline to implement CPE for this school year is September 4th. We'll repeat what we stated at the July 10th meeting. PTA Council believes that CEP is a key part of the community school wraparound services model. Meeting children's most basic needs and supporting their families have been proven to create the stability needed to increase academic achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker from the Council of Administrative and Supervisory Employees is Tom DeHart. Good evening, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, and members of the board. In January of this year, I spoke to this board 
of the necessity to provide essential professional development to the community superintendents and the executive directors in the four system zones around the shift in supervision of principals from an outdated compliance mindset to one of coaching and support to improve the principal's capacity for instructional leadership. I shared then that, sadly, there was a great inconsistency within and between the zones as to how principals were supported and evaluated. Tonight, I'm most pleased to share with you that under the leadership of Superintendent White, COE Billy Burke, and the four community superintendents, Baltimore County has committed to changing that paradigm. For the last few months, a representative work group has worked diligently to rework the principal evaluation, which is framed by the 10 Professional Standards for Educational Leaders, PSELs. Through a partnership with CASE, a meaningful and purposeful framework has been developed. This framework, however, isn't worth the paper that it's printed on if it's not effectively and consistently executed across the system. To ensure the fidelity of the implementation of this evaluation system, the leadership staff in all zones have participated in unpacking and uh, uh, looking at the philosophy and strategies in supervising principals as laid out in the PSEL companion document, Voluntary Standards for Principal Supervisors. In addition to this initial professional development for all zone staff, the executive directors will meet regularly over the course of this school year as a professional learning community to share experiences, seek clarification, and learn from one another. This ongoing collaboration between zone leadership will help create much needed consistency and inner reader reliability. Amid everything an executive director does, by far the most important is increasing the skills of the building level principal. This will be a heavy lift with new learning and mindsets on all sides. I am convinced, however, that this continuous growth model is a necessary component to improve student achievement. And with the time I have left, I'd like to wish the folks behind me who are being promoted best wishes for success in their new assignments. Thank you. Very good. Our next item is general public comment, and our first speaker of the evening is Mr. David Green. Good evening. I'm gonna do three things tonight. I'm gonna list a few reasons in favor of keeping Verlita White as the permanent superintendent. I'm gonna list some challenges that she faces and some things she might do to win over the critics on the board and elsewhere. Um, in favor, Ms. White has a, a deep knowledge of BCPS, long and deep. She's very intelligent, communicates well, works very, very hard, would provide continuity in the coming years where there's gonna be a lot of board change and she's liked and trusted by many. I'm gonna skip over what the critics have said, um, but there's one other thing I like about what she has done in the past, and in defending herself uh, here, at one point she said how important it was to look outside BCPS and the schools of education to find solutions to the problems that we have, and I'm 100% in agreement with that um, because a lot of the innovations we've had um, have come from elsewhere. So that's very important. So, but, but Ms. White, you've, uh, you've been dealt a difficult hand. A lot of it comes from top-down policies from higher levels of government. No child left behind, race to the top, dear colleague letters, single-minded single focus on AP tests as a measure of our school systems. And as Abby Baton just said, um, one of the things that faces you now is pressure to do a one-size-fits-all focus on restorative justice. So you have a big, huge challenge here. So what might you do to win over your critics on the board and elsewhere? Um, one thing I think you need to do um, is criticize the worst of the top-down policies wherever they come from. Second, I think you need to drive out fear among your troops below you. I think there's a fair amount of it and there's way too much. And uh, that's a shout out to W. Edwards Deming and if you, don't, if you haven't heard from him, look it up. I think you need to engage your critics. 
um, including those on the board, but also those who voted with their feet to leave the school system to go to homeschooling, parochial schools, or private schools. I think you need to work very, very hard to find common ground with your, your critics. And there are two areas, I think, that where it's critical to do this. One is STAT. And of all the people um, in BCPS, you are in the best position, I think, to know what the weaknesses of STAT are. Um, I think it's probably good that you weren't the person that drove it because you should be willing to admit the faults and, and work to fix them. And secondly, the, in the area of behavior and social media is a big problem. And I think if you work with your conservative critics, I Thank you. Our second speaker is Megan Berger. share my three minutes with my colleague? Typically that is not the case, no. Good evening, my name is Megan Berger. I'm an attorney at Disability Rights Maryland. We engage in educational advocacy across the state and represent students in special education matters as well as school discipline matters. We are here, I am here, to express concerns about BCPS's current approach to discipline as set out in its policies, regulations, and practices. Our analysis is that this approach does not fully comply with the law, but even more important to those here tonight, is likely to be counterproductive and actually undermine school climate rather than keeping schools safe. Kicking kids out of school for misbehaving simply does not work, and there's a substantial body of research backing this up. Suspension and expulsion does not address the underlying causes of behavior, does not teach kids how to improve behavior, and is, as noted by a previous speaker. It also leads to disengagement and isolation from school, poor academic performance, grade repetition, dropping out, involvement in the juvenile justice system, and a negative school climate for all kids. Disproportionately, it also impacts children of color, even though rates of misbehavior are similar across racial lines. In BCPS during 2016-2017, African American children made up 39% of the student population, but 66% of children suspended. Children with disabilities made up 13% of the student population, but 25% of children suspended. These are not just theoretical problems. We see them with our clients in BCPS every day, and we hope that you'll have the opportunity to hear from them throughout the course of this coming school year. There are alternatives to suspension that are effective, restorative practices, functional behavioral analyses and behavioral intervention plans, community conferencing, peer mediation, conflict resolution, counseling and mental health services. These are just a few effective and viable alternatives to suspension and expulsion. The state has moved forward by passing regulations in 2014 to move away from zero tolerance, but BCPS has lagged behind by not fully implementing them. We are concerned that BCPS school discipline policies do not align with the law. We've sent a letter addressing our concerns to members of the board and are encouraged by the response we received. We look forward to providing future comment on school discipline policies and procedures. Thank you. Thank you. Our third and final speaker is Dr. Bosch Verone. Good evening to all. As you know, the First Amendment says, no law respecting establishment of religion. And it also says, forbidden promoting one religion over another. It also says forbids restriction of one's religious practices. It also guarantees the citizens to assemble freely. It also forbids that the government entanglement 
with the religion. So all this First Amendment is from 1789. And when it comes to the school system, the school system advertises for the Jewish holidays, recognizes the Jewish holidays, closes on the Jewish holidays, all against all the facts that have been presented to you in the past. <clears throat> so if you really go for the facts is, Dr. Berger, when he advocated closure on his Jewish holidays, he had no data. Then Mr. Marcioni was an interim. He followed the same routine, no data. Then came Dr. Hirston, and there were no data. Just done it. Dr. Dance did the same thing, no data. Where is the data? One senator came in last year to support closure on its Jewish holidays, no data. One political leader of an organization dedicated for foreign policy, maybe one teacher, two teachers spoke. All that versus 1,000 plus Muslim American residents that came to this Board of Education since 2004. All that when we had a review about the holidays, we filled all this room. Very objective data. So I want you to tell me that this book says it's okay to advocate one holiday over all others. I want you to tell me that one size fits all. The school system has to close all the schools just because there is a minority of teachers in there, in one area. Just tell me that I left my country, my home, my house, my desk, my books, my classical music records, to come here for liberty and justice for all. When I come here and I see that the school system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fromm. Just not right there. You can probably put it to the left over there for tonight. Uh, absolutely. We'll do that later, though. <laughs> uh, we did not have any member of the public sign up as it relates to our four policies for this evening. We will move to item F, which is the superintendent's report. And we'll call on Ms. White. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. So I would like to take some time to talk about the Baltimore County Cares for Kids program. As we look ahead to our next uh, wonderful school year, I am so pleased to share that students at all schools who qualify for free or reduced priced meals will receive breakfast and lunch at no cost to their families throughout the Baltimore County Cares for Kids program. The Baltimore County Cares for Kids a program is a thoughtful, system-wide solution that provides meaningful benefits to families while protecting Title I funding for our schools and protecting students from losing the supplemental benefits that come with free and reduced price meal eligibility. Some advocates have recommended expansion of the community eligibility provision or the CEP to certain schools which would further affect our Title I schools and would cause individual students to lose supplemental benefits that I will describe in just a moment. While Baltimore County Cares for Kids supports all of our schools, expanding the CEP is not a system-wide solution for BCPS. So what are those supplemental benefits? A family of four earning $46,435 or less annually is eligible for so much more than just a meal. Benefits include fee waivers for the following, the ACT, advanced placement exams, CCBC, college applications, and college athletics, as well as fee waivers for retaking the SAT, which is offered to all BCPS grade 11 students at no cost during the school day. In addition, families eligible for free or reduced price meals may apply for low-cost, high-speed internet at home and low-cost internet-ready computer uh, through the Internet Essentials from Comcast. 
Supports for students in need also include priority admission to free, high quality, pre-kindergarten, free school supplies, and reduced cost or no cost field trips, graduation gowns, and other educational resources. Baltimore County Cares for Kids is fiscally responsible and sustainable. For $486,000 this school year, Baltimore County Cares for Kids will offer meals at no cost at all schools to students whose families are eligible. The Maryland Cares for Kids Act, which is legislation signed by Governor Larry Hogan in May 2018, will fully replace county funds with state funds by FY 2023. I want to thank our school staff who worked closely, who, who continue to work closely with our families to emphasize the new and continued benefits of meal eligibility, as well as acknowledging our community advocates. I encourage our community partners to join us as we expand awareness of the benefits of applying for free and reduced priced meals, benefits that extend, of course, beyond meals. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our staff members for their hard work this summer and for their commitment to students. Many times over the summer, and I'm just going to uh, switch gears to our summer programs, many times people think that the learning stops or that the work stops for the summer, but we know that that isn't the case. We have so many staff members who do incredible work over the summer, from curriculum writing to engaging in professional development to making sure that our buildings are ready and that they're in top-notch shape and condition for the return of students and so much learning occurs as well when it comes to students and our extended year programs as well so tonight's video will highlight uh, some of that that go occurs in the summer and again hats off to everyone involved in the CEP process I know that our teams got together worked so hard since that legislation passed in May uh, we've been working diligently to make sure that we have a solution to provide for kids who need it the most and for our families who need it the most. And our team has gone out of their way to make sure that coming through this coming school year, we'll work with our counselors and our PPWs. Remember that our budget, in our budget, we talked about people for our people. Well, we're going to put those people to work to make sure that we're reaching out to our families and letting them know that we can help them with filling out the form, making sure that they have awareness of the form, and that we can have the best of both worlds. We can make sure that no kid goes hungry and we don't have to lose any benefits for our students, and we can protect our Title I funding as well. So hats off to our school-based and central office staff for working on such a comprehensive plan for all of our students. And again, thank you to all of our staff members um, for working with our students over the summer and to prepare for our summer, um, to prepare for our school opening. So if we can start that video, we can show a little bit about what happened this summer. Well, school is out for the summer, but learning didn't stop at Baltimore County Public Schools. Executive leadership, principals, and assistant principals were able to gather together and reflect and explore the vision for the upcoming school year at the annual Leadership Academy. This year's Leadership Academy of Baltimore County Public Schools 2018, it provided the leadership teams, whether they be executive leadership or school-based leadership, the opportunity to come together, reflect on our previous year's practice, and set ourselves up for much needed success in the near future. Then, BCPS held its Blended Learning Institute, which offered its participants various sessions that tie blended learning throughout all disciplines. The different ideas that I've been exposed to, both with kinesthetic learning as well as integrating technology, has really I kind of opened my mind to figure out what I need to do for my students and also for the other staff that are working in the building to help us kind of coordinate and collaborate to make a positive force with these students. And when you have a great curriculum, our BCPS students can be successful in and out of the classroom. Summer curriculum workshops are incredibly beneficial for both our professionals and our students. Baltimore County Schools has a proud tradition of curriculum for our teachers by our teachers. And what makes this such a rejuvenating opportunity for our teachers is they have the opportunity to review, discuss with one another, and challenge each other's thinking to make sure that our instruction is relevant and rigorous and current for our students in today's context. 
And speaking of our students, they were loaded with various activities and STEM programs. My favorite thing about STEM camp is math because it helps me get smarter. Then you had rising sixth graders who were afforded the opportunity to participate in a four-week Love for Literacy program held at Catonsville Middle School. I love this Love and Literacy program because it keeps my mind fresh during the summer and I love reading and I get to meet new people that will hopefully be my friends while I go in sixth grade. The teacher is very nice and funny and we also get to do fun things that include learning. So we designed the Love for Literacy program to basically increase access and increase opportunities for students to interact with really rigorous coursework. We did this especially for those students who are underrepresented in advanced academics. We know that by interacting with this content and the teachers here during the summer, that these students are going to be ready to hit the ground running come fall. Another fun activity was the Summer Visual Art Camp held at Perry Hall High School. Oh, what I like about this camp is that I get to not only experiment with more art materials since I haven't really done oil painting before, but I also get to meet people who have the same um, goals as me and who also like art. So the benefits for the campers are they're immersed in art all day long and they get art from for a longer period of time, they get art from different instructors and they have a really good time while they're doing it. Finally, a student who they said reflects the very best of what AVID is, a 2018 Overly High School graduate, Madison Wood, was selected to speak at the National AVID Summer Institute in Philadelphia out of 1,000 applicants. She is the third AVID student from BCPS and the first from Overly to be selected for this opportunity. It feels really amazing to be selected to be a part of this because I love being able to represent Baltimore County and I was really happy to be able to speak about AVID and how AVID helped me. So as you can see, we have amazing staff, we have amazing students as well and the learning continues throughout the summer. Mr. Stewart, that is my report. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> we move on to the chair's report. I am no chair, but I will be for an evening, and so I'll say on behalf of Mr. Gillis, uh, I'd like to acknowledge, as Ms. White did, the hard work of our team over the course of this summer. Um, this is not uh, something that is um, uh, anything less than a passion for our teachers, our administrators, and our, and our team. And I think it's reflected in the video, reflected in the work that they do in uh, day in, day out, and the board recognizes that. I also want to encourage uh, our, our students who completed graduation requirements uh, during the summer. We c commend you on your perseverance, and I look forward to welcoming you into the class of 2018 when you all walk across the stage at summer graduation ceremony, and that is, for those keeping track, Saturday, August 18th. And finally, uh, thank you to Ms. White and her team for supporting uh, the Baltimore County Cares for Kids. Um, we are proud to work together to provide services to our kids, to provide those basic measures of health and success to ensure a foundation of success for our kids. We know that I think as a school system, we are more than just a provider of education, but we're a provider uh, of the whole child. And we try to provide those wraparound services to our kids as best we can. And we look forward to working together in ways of compromise and consensus to do that to the best of our ability. Uh, so thank you for that. With that, that concludes my remarks, and I will turn it over to our student member for hers. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Good evening, everyone. I am Halima Adekoya, student member of the Board of Education. On July 17, 2018, I had the opportunity of visiting the curriculum writing workshop for BCPS. The workshop consisted of dedicated BCPS teachers who sacrificed time out of their summer schedules to create and revise certain curriculum set in place to ensure more flexibility as well as applicable and accessible access for both students and teachers. The group of teachers we're working hard in making sure for both making sure that all students, despite their learning skills or level of comprehensions, were given the space and resources to flourish accordingly. I am very thankful to all the teachers and staff that dedicated their time and efforts to give us students the best education possible. With that being said, students, our school year will soon commence. I am very excited for what this year will bring. Each individual student under BCPS matters. Whether it is an art student, STEM student, an athlete, or a student, student still discovering their talents or gifts 
or ideas. Each student matters. You matter and your voice matters as well. Decisions made by the board, teachers, and administration pertaining to BCPS students should also always have our collective interest at heart. It is because of them that we are here, and they matter as well. Policies created, discussed, and voted on regarding students should continuously uphold the standard of making the right decisions that involves the greater interest of each BCPS student's individuality and personal needs. There should be no selfish or self right righteous intent when it comes to the students of BCPS and matters that concern them. With the 2018-2019 school year right around the corner, I am very excited to interact with you as students of BCPS. With that being said, BCSC is hosting a BCPS night at the yard featuring Kenwood, Kenwood Air Force, JRTC, Bringing in the Colors, and the Delaney website for, e for more, uh, sorry, and the high school chamber choir singing and anthem in O Canada. Check out the BCPS website for more information. Students, you're the reason why I am here. Please do not hesitate to contact me or email me or invite me to any school events. I cannot wait to see all of your beautiful faces. Everyone must remember to put your best foot forward this school year, set your goals, and do not stop achieving them. Class of 2019, this is our year. Let us lead the way on this initiative and set a positive example for each class coming after us. Thank you. Fires me up. <laughs> All right. Item, item I, we'll move on. Uh, Dr. Mayo, that's going to be tough to follow, um, but I'm going to call you up for some personnel matters. I would agree. <coughs> Good evening, Vice Chair Gillis. I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Vice Chair Stewart, <laughs> Superintendent <laughs> that, White, that didn't happen, members of the uh, board. Yeah. <laughs> Just program, sorry. Um, I would like board consent for the following personnel matters. Terminations, certification requirements not met, retirements, resignations, leaves, Deceased Recognition of Service and Area Education Advisory Council appointment. Board members, comments, questions as it relates to those items. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the personal matters as presented in exhibits uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry, it's I1 through I6. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Very good. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. We now have new business administrative appointments, and I'm calling on Ms. White. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Vice Chairman Stewart and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for the, your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal, Padonia Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Deer Park Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Dundalk High School. Assistant Principal, Edgemere Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Fort Garrison Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Maiden Choice School. Assistant Principal, Mars Estates Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Overly High School. Assistant Principal, Parkville Middle School. Assistant Principal, Sussex Elementary School. Assistant Principal, West Towson Elementary School. Community Superintendent, Zone 1. Executive Director, School Support. Senior Operations Supervisor. Logistics, Office of Facilities, Support Services. And Specialist Compliance, Office of Title I. Very good. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments, uh, appointments as presented in Exhibit J? Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, I'd like to ask the following persons in attendance to please stand when you hear your name and you might also stand friends and family members so that we can recognize you and celebrate you. First, we have Emmanuel Andre, who will be the new assistant principal at Dundalk High School. <laughs> do you have friends or family here with you tonight? I do indeed. My wife, Luca. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'd also like to recognize Teresa Brady, specialist, compliance, office of Do you have anyone here with you this evening? Well, we're all your family. Yeah. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize Christopher Carter, Assistant Principal, West Towson Elementary School. Anyone here with you this evening, Christopher? They can stand so that we can recognize them. Very good. <laughs> Congratulations. 
but I'd also like to recognize Kayla Denmeyer Pranger, Assistant Principal, Fort Garrison Elementary School. <laughs> Kayla, who do you have here with you tonight? Um, I have my parents, mm -hmm. Heather and Don. I have my husband, Ryan. I have my new principal, Dr. Um, Byer. And then my previous principal and assistant principal, Ms. Harris. The apple doesn't fall far. <laughs> Congratulations. We'd also like to recognize Melissa DiDonato, who will be the new Executive Director of School Support in the Office of Community Superintendent. <laughs> Congratulations, Melissa. Who do you have here with you tonight? My team and my principal. Congratulations. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize Joseph Donnelly, who will be the new Assistant Principal at Sussex Elementary School. So who do you have here with you tonight? Uh, my wife, Pearson, and my new principal, Tom Bassett. Okay, very good. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Audra, La Audra Laurie Ellick, who will be the assistant principal of Edgemere Elementary School. Audra, who do you have here with you tonight? My husband, Nicholas, and my former principal and friend, Chandra Patrick. <laughs> Congratulations. We'd like to recognize Katie Fridley, who will be the assistant principal at Deer Park Elementary School. <laughs> who do you have here with you tonight? My Beautiful. Congratulations. <laughs> Good job, guys, on the Pledge of Allegiance, too, by the way. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize Brittany Keith, who will be the assistant principal at Overly High School. <laughs> Brittany, you have anyone here with you tonight? Congratulations. We'd also like to recognize Jennifer Mullinex, who will be the new executive director of school support in the Office of Community Superintendent, Zone 2. <laughs> Congratulations, Jen. Who do you have here with you tonight? Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize Daniel Pizzo, who will be the new principal of Padonia Elementary School. <laughs> Dan, who do you have here with you tonight? Well, my family's supposed to be watching online, so. <laughs> Hi, family. And then my former principal, Mrs. Giannato. Congratulations. We'd also like to recognize Stephanie Schillen, who will be the new assistant principal of Mars Estates Elementary School. <laughs> Stephanie, who do you have here with you this evening? Congratulations. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize Susan Truesdale, who will be the new executive director of school support, Office of the Community Superintendent. Sue, who do you have here with you this evening? <laughs> Congratulations. We'd also like to recognize Catherine, Catherine West, who will be the new assistant principal, Maiden Choice School. Congratulations, Catherine. Who do you have here with you this evening? I have my principal, Dr. Nancy Briganti my husband, Tim, and my friend and AP at uh, Dundalk Elementary, uh, Jen Szymanski. Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize other who, others who could not be in attendance tonight, but I think they need to be celebrated. Um, they are, many of are on vacation <laughs> this week. Uh, they didn't know they were going to be promoted and the board meeting would be tonight, but uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, so we would like to recognize Dr. Raquel Jones, who will be the new community superintendent, Zone 1, in the Office of the Community <laughs> Superintendent. I'd also like to recognize Orly Mondell, who will be the assistant principal of Parkville Middle School. As well as Robert Powers, who will be the senior operations supervisor in logistics, office of facilities, uh, support services, and the logistics section. Congratulations. And congratulations to all. Thank you. Thank you. 
I think you have the best part of the meeting. <laughs> so at this time, I'd like to call Mr. Nussbaum to our table. And if folks have dinner and so forth, please feel free. <laughs> we usually take a moment. It always happens. <laughs> <laughs> I arrive and everyone leaves. <laughs> Every we can't escape, I know. <laughs> yeah, right. Otherwise, you all would leave, too. <laughs> all right, we'll proceed. Okay. Uh, good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in your quasi-judicial capacity. That appeal was considered on the record because there was no request for oral argument made. Uh, at this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action taken in that closed session in the matter uh, that was before you, and it is hearing examiner number 18-49. Very good. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Do I have a second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. Thank you. Very good. Thank Any you. opposed? Seeing none. Motion carries. Thank you. Ah, excuse me. For the record, Mr. Birch excuses, uh, recuses himself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Birch. All right, we move on to item L. And now I get to wear the hat of the Building and Contracts Committee Chair. Members of the board, Building Contracts Committee met earlier this evening and are forwarding items L1 through L12 to the full board for approval. Uh, is there any uh, board member who would like to separate one of these items for consideration? All right, seeing none, uh, do I have a motion to approve items L1 through L12? So moved. I don't need a second, right? Correct. Correct, very good. All in favor, please raise your hands. All opposed? Okay, the motion carries. We move on to item M, which is unfinished business, uh, Board of Education Policies, and I call on Mr. Virch. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair and members of our board, our Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that our board accept this report of our committee's recommendation to amend board policy 6800 field trips and foreign travel. The proposed amended policy is presented to our board on tonight's board agenda as exhibit M. The committee received no public comments on this policy. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee? Very good. No second is required. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Okay, we have a unanimous aye for that. So we will move on to item N, new business report on the proposed FY 2020 state capital budget. Is it Mr. Saris or is it Mr. Smith or is it everyone? Hello. It's everybody. <laughs> Great, the whole is party. <laughs> Mr. Stewart is there coming forward and members of the board. I'm pleased to present the FY 2020 State Capital Improvement Program for the board's review. In our efforts to be transparent and consistent with previous discussions on this subject, the schedule for the board's approval consists of a four-step process. Presentation for board review tonight uh, and requests for questions to be submitted by Monday, August 13th, a work session scheduled for Tuesday, August 21st, uh, which is a board meeting, a board work session. Also, final approval by the board at the September 11th, 2018 meeting. This process and timeline will give the board a little over a month uh, to review the material and to ask questions and to sort through all of the materials uh, that we've provided to you so that you have sufficient time uh, to, to make um, your decisions. So I'm requesting that Mr. Smith and his team uh, share the plan at this time with the board. 
Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, as you can see, it's three of us. It really doesn't need to be three of us to deliver this, but we wanted you to see what was going to take place when we come back at the work session that will happen on the 21st. It'll be the three of us, and we will try to respond to any questions you may have uh, um, in, in writing in advance and can provide back to you. Um, this is the capital plan for the FY20 program. Um, our team has worked closely with strategic planning and our funding agencies, both state and local, to get to a point where we can move a state capital request. As you can remember, this document is a living document as we, it goes through its various phases. So all of you are aware of that. You've gone through that process before. So what you see now will we'll have some changes that will take place throughout the process, dollar amounts, estimates, and things of that nature. But we wanted to make sure we brought that to you today. I'm joined by Mr. George Saris and Mr. Pete Dixit. At this time, I'm going to ask Mr. Dixit to walk you through the capital plan. There's going to be a lot of items up there that you are very familiar with. They're just going into different phases of the process. With that being said, I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixit for his review. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and good evening, Vice Chair uh, Stewart, uh, Superintendent, and the board members. As Mr. Smith and the Superintendent has indicated, this proposed request is for fiscal year 20. In the interest of clarity and transparency, uh, it is Superintendent's desire for me to go step by step and explain this. As you will see, the last year's budget, which is the attachment for FY 2019, dated May 31st, 2018, shows the final status of the capital program as it pertains to state at the end of the year. The most important columns for you are the extreme left column with the school name and the extreme right column for the state recommended amount. So this, the, the left column indicates priority of projects and the name of schools, and the right column indicates the total amount of money that we have received from state in fiscal 2019. The fiscal 20 request, which is the next attachment, is similar to fiscal 19 with some changes that I'll go step by step. Some of the projects have been taken away, taken out from the fiscal 19 request because they have already been fully funded. Names of those projects are air conditioning for Franklin High School and Kenwood High School. Then the next batch of projects are Victory Villa Elementary School and Lansdowne Elementary Schools that have been fully funded by the state. The second batch of project is the scope of work revision. Pine Grove Middle School has been changed uh, to renovation addition from just an addition that was submitted in the last year's budget. Red House Run Elementary and the Deer Park Ele Elementary School have been changed to replacement from addition. And Scott's Branch has been changed from an addition to addition renovation. These changes have been made uh, because as Mr. Smith indicated, it is a, a continuous living document, and as more and more information becomes available, we have a dialogue with our funding partners, and we change the status because it's in, in the interest of the school system, and it is more cost effective to do so. The next set of changes is the removal of Fort Garrison because the latest projection numbers do not support uh, inclusion of that, uh, that, that project. And finally, as a result of board's action last year, we have added Lansdowne High School as a replacement project. While we have added this project, I want to remind the board that there's a high school study going on, and we'll be sharing the results uh, of the, that study, study later on. Um, the next batch of projects are what we call systemic, and these are infrastructure improvements which include roof re replacement for four schools, which is Stonely, uh, Hollabird Middle, Deep Creek, and Church Lane Elementary School. These are the next on our list for, for roof replacement, and they are followed by boiler system replacement as Chase Elementary and Elmwood Elementary School. Also, the chiller replacement for the central air conditioning uh, for Timber Grove and Seneca Elementary School. These 
projects and information along with the dollar numbers will be adjusted from time to time as more and more scope of the work is available and we'll be sharing with you in our next work session and update. Uh, we are requesting that any questions be submitted by August 13th uh, and we'll have the responses uh, during the work session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith, just very quickly, um, not to be out of order here, but when we do have an opportunity to hear from you all and your team as it relates to a improvement or proposed improvement to our 10-year plan or how we craft one, we look forward to that as well. Thanks. And Ms. Causey, perhaps you and I can talk about that offline. Our next item is board member comments. We are here. Um, we will start with Mr. Hayden. Since so many people have left, can I take the 45 minutes that I want to take? <laughs> you would anyway, right? Come on. We've come through a, another year, gotten through it well, and thanks to our teachers and our staff, uh, we've done another credible job of educating children, which is our charge. Now, what can we ask for coming up? We can ask for the staff and the teachers to do an even better job. And um, that means more emphasis on those issues that we know are all out there, that we've talked about facing, and I think indeed that uh, we'll get to. So I'm looking forward to the upcoming year. Uh, I think there are a lot of challenges. It'll be a, a, just a, a great opportunity. Very good. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's been a long time since we've had uh, member comments, but I'm gonna keep mine short. Um, I also wanna thank our team, um, our staff, our 12-month employees who work diligently year-round whether it's in instruction, leadership, uh, whether it's support for the schools or the teachers, whether it's facilities, ground maintenance, um, the many, many things that go on year round, especially I wanna point out all of the construction that's been going on this summer that's really gonna be a benefit to our students and our teachers and our staff when we have open uh, new schools and schools with additions and schools with renovations and schools with additions of central air conditioning. So I especially wanted to applaud um, all of our staff for working on all of those things that are gonna help our students uh, this year, that are gonna help our teachers be able to do a better job um, of providing instruction and the, and the mission of educating our youth. Um, I was also pleased this summer to attend some of those um, opportunities where the 12-month staff comes together. We had Leadership Academy where they talked about a number of issues in terms of zones. Um, also, we have a new device rollout that's coming to the high schools. So I appreciate the IT staff and everyone that's been involved in that. It, we've, it's a big, heavy lift that they've been asked to do, and I appreciate all of their efforts to do that. Um, also, we have the Schoology which is a new learning management system that's affecting pretty much everyone in the system, students, teachers, support staff, central office, uh, and again, our IT. So um, also as a parent, I'm looking forward to getting my training on that to understand how I can keep track of my student and, and how well he'll be doing this year. Um, I also was really pleased to attend the uh, school safety conference that was put on by April Lewis and her tremendous team. They are working constantly and diligently to protect our students, to protect our staff, to protect our school communities. And I'm so very grateful for all of the uh, new initiatives that they're working on, and I'm very pleased with that. And I think that they don't get the recognition that they uh, really deserve in all of the things that they're doing. And I appreciate uh, the interim superintendent and her focus with people for our people that's going to allow those programs to make a positive impact on our students. Um, and as uh, was pointed out by Ms. Baton, one of those issues is the discipline 
that needs to be continually improved. Uh, there are policies that are going to be looked at in October. Uh, I thank the board members that supported my motion in bringing those policies forward to start discussing them and see how we can improve those. And certainly we're going to be taking into account the input from TABCO and the other discipline committees that are gathering input from our communities. Um, also, I wanted to say that it's uh, very important for our stakeholders to email board members questions about the capital construction plan and uh, to be focused on that. Uh, also, I'm very excited to attend the summer graduation. We have students that have been working very hard over the summer with their teachers uh, to get that final credit or whatever it was that they needed to walk across the stage. So we're very proud of them and I'm happy to be involved in that. Um, the other issue is the high school capacity study. There's ongoing work that's available on our website. Um, and I would point out that uh, when we're looking at strategic plans, I've been advocating for uh, a comprehensive plan, which we're not doing, we're doing the high school capacity study, but I think it will behoove us to in the future to look at a comprehensive plan along the lines of Anne Arundel County Public Schools. So uh, with that, I'm looking forward to attending more events this summer and I appreciate the work of the team that's been going on this summer. It's really going to impact our students and teachers positively. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yulfoner. Thank you. Um, I really wanted to, uh, two things. One, I wanted to make sure that the board understands how important summer graduation is. You know, we've attended graduations for the last several years, but I got to tell you, I don't, I don't think there's any more appreciative group of parents than you'll see at summer graduation. It's really magnificent. It was started just a few years ago, and I think it's been a, a roaring success, and the uh, parents have commented more and more how they really appreciate it. The other thing I just want to talk in general, uh, to the public. Uh, we have an election coming up relative to our county executive, our county council. Um, there's, everybody seems to want to support education, but no one really wants to basically put the money where their mouth is. And in order to support education, and in order to support a program of building to accommodate the increased enrollment, uh, it's gonna have to be funded. And uh, I would hope that when you talk to your, those who are running for office, that you question them about how they intend to fund our programs. I said this many years ago, I still say it, that the status of our buildings is a result of neglect over the last 25 and 30 years. And everybody talks about how good education should be and how we must take care of our students, but no one seems to want to pay the price for it. So just remember that when you talk to your future uh, elected officials. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Adekoya. Hello, everybody. Well, I just want to thank Team BCPS for its continuous work. It truly means a lot, especially as a student representative. I would just like to say for the upcoming school year, it shall be a great one. It shall be a great one. I'm looking forward to interacting with so many students and learning and gaining knowledge. And I just want to say as a team, we must move forward. We must remember that we must look forward and not backwards. And we must work together as a community who has each other's backs because we are all we have as Baltimore County Public School System. Thank you, Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I'd just like to mention for a moment that two issues um, have risen to the forefront of our discussions and focus over the summer and the last few months. And, and those are, um, one, feeding or expanding the nutritional opportunities for poor and hungry students. And the other is increasing the safety and school climate. And both of those issues really scream out for collaboration and effective action on the part of our board. Um, and I think if we, again, uh, look at those two items, they just scream out that we need to really work together and do some positive things to improve that. I applaud the system for uh, expanding the um, free breakfast and lunch for additional students. But I think the board is also interested in looking at the CEP program at the pilot schools that we have. 
And um, I don't think we want to close the door to any opportunity that's going to enhance the um, nutritional options for our students. So we're going to leave everything open. And I don't think Ms. White is indicating in any way that we're not going to leave everything open. But we just have to be very smart about how we go about trying to help our poor and hungry students. And in terms of school climate, I haven't met any family or parent around Baltimore County, regardless of the area that they're in, that don't want their students to go to school and be safe and they also want equitable uh, responses to actions no matter what zip code they live in or wherever so I think again these are both issues that the board can work collaboratively with the system uh, and just keep I'm talking to myself here keep an open mind to any solution that's going to make our uh, school system safer and um, uh, address the uh, issues that were so eloquently presented by um, Ms. Berger and Ms. Baton tonight. I think there are a lot of perspectives that we have to consider when we talk about school climate, um, but I think we all want the same thing, uh, all the board members, all the parents, so we just have to find ways to work together uh, to address those two issues in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Nick. I know the time is 7.35. Um, that being the case, this being uh, are still early in August, I would like to uh, wish a continually safe and uh, enjoyable summer to our thousands of staff and student families. Uh, for our students, please uh, continue your summer uh, enjoying yourself and the, uh, the learning that you, uh, I know on the side you're still engaging in. And when you come back in September, our schools will be up and ready and welcoming as will all of our staff and our superintendent um, for all of our students to come back and uh, continue their educations. Thank you, Ms. Eaton. I too would like to thank Abby from Tabco for her remarks on behavior and discipline. I agree with them 100%. Discipline isn't something that we can resolve overnight or even in a school year. However, it doesn't mean that we stop trying or stop implementing new ideas. In order to correct discipline in the classroom, discipline must be combated at home and in society as a whole. Students need to learn civility. They need to realize that they must practice politeness like they practice sports. Civility doesn't come naturally for some, so as adults, we must emulate the correct way for our young students to act. And we must expect students to display good behavior. Parents and other caregivers are students' first teachers. Students should know how to how to act civil before they enter school, and then the school teachers can build upon what the students learn at home. Curing discipline, curing discipline problems is not just a school issue, it's a societal issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. The great thing about being last is you can go on and on and <laughs> on, at least until the people behind you turn off your mic. So I had the opportunity to attend um, the summer curriculum writing workshop. I went into the engineering section, of course, and I was quite impressed with what they were doing in there and the thoroughness that those teachers were showing in approaching it, not just from a one-year plan, but laying the groundwork and foundation for it for engineering and coursework from middle school through the high school years. Um, so to those teachers, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, unfortunately for everybody, you weren't last. <laughs> I'm just gonna take a point of privilege here and share uh, a couple of remarks. We, I just take note that we have about four months left as the board is currently comprised and I want to encourage us to think about the ways in which we want to be proactive as we run through the finish line as opposed to jogging or what have you. 
And I know that we as a board, and naturally so, have a tendency to be reactive to the things that are before us, but we also have an incredible capacity in this moment in time for the next few months to be proactive and to think ahead about the things that we want to get done collectively, and whether that's something like a 10-year plan that models in Rundle counties, or whether that's revisiting Muslim holidays, or whether it's college and career readiness on the website, Michael looking at you, whether it's cultural proficiency or school start times and transportation and having the sense of where that's going and maybe making a decision on that front, performance management, the next generation thereof. We have opportunities in front of us. I just encourage us to, to take advantage of that and to try to get it done uh, in the time that we have left. It is, in fact, a blessing, and um, we're going to work towards it. That's all I have for this evening. Um, and so we have some information that's posted on our website, but I can now say that the next Board of Education meeting is scheduled. Mr. Hayden. I would really like, uh, Mr. Stewart, if you would leave Mr. Hills a few notes okay. on how to handle the length of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> It will be noted in the record. Uh, the next meeting of our board is scheduled for Tuesday, August 21st, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. The meeting is adjourned.